To read David Foster Wallace was to feel your eyelids pulled open. Writers who can do this, like Salinger and Fitzgerald, forge an unbreakable bond with readers. I was sent David Lipsky's book by my longtime manager and friend, David Cantor, who is one of the producers of our movie. Became very excited at the prospect of pairing these two very intensely smart men. And of course, one of them happens to be David Foster Wallace, who is one of the great chroniclers of our time. Hey, you made it. Yeah. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Dave Wallace. David Lipsky, it's a, it's a pleasure, so. And the very notion of placing David Foster Wallace on the American landscape suggested a road picture and not a two-hander on a stage. It just seemed much more expansive and panoramic. I don't think writers are smarter than other people. I think they may be more compelling in their stupidity. Coming into this project, all of us, a part of this team, were very keenly aware of the expectations and the, the protectiveness that people felt toward Wallace's legacy. I'm sorry, man. What's wrong? It's just you're gonna go back to New York and like sit at your desk and shape this thing however you want. And that, I mean, to me, it's just extremely disturbing. <laughs> Why is it disturbing? I don't even know if I like you yet. I'm so nervous about whether you like me. The excitement of translating Lipsky's book into a film was that it, it gave us an opportunity to get inside Wallace's head and to hear him articulate and embody so many of the ideas, so many of the perceptions he had about our society. So uh, do, do you not have a television? I do not have a TV, no. How come? Because if I had a TV, I would watch it all the time. Ah. Wallace is the kind of writer whose voice is so intimate. And I think that what people have responded to so passionately about his work over the last 25 years is the intimacy of that voice. I relied solely on David Lipsky's book, which is a transcription of five days of conversation. And it was in talking to David Lipsky about, well, what was happening when the tape wasn't running that really gave me a sense of how to structure this as a story. A lot of women in magazines are pretty in a way that is not erotic because they don't look like anybody that you know. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yes. like you can't imagine them putting a quarter in a parking meter or like eating a bologna sandwich. What I saw in this material was an opportunity to portray writers in a realistic way. You know, the agony, <laughs> the loneliness, the self-doubt. Wow, just happen to have one on you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I did debate whether or not I should do this. Why? Writers have crushes on each other. I think it's just a, the nature of the craft. You see something that someone is able to accomplish, you envy it, you emulate it, you aspire to gaining the approval of that person who has inspired you. Seeing this window into his life and mind might introduce a new generation to his work, which I think would be one of our great accomplishments if we were able to pull that off. David thought books existed to stop you from feeling lonely. If I could, I'd say to David that living those days with him reminded me of what life is like, instead of being a relief from it. And uh, I'd tell him it made me feel much less alone. What's this story about in your mind? Just what it's like to be the most talked about writer in the country, that sort of thing. You're like a nervous guy, huh? <laughs> no, 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 I'm okay. How are you? I, cause I'm terrified.